Well, I really appreciate the invitation to come here. Thank you for uh, fixing our future. Um, and the message I'm hearing that I'm loving is sort of thinking differently. And, and I've been in a business where my friends say to me, hey, I've been doing this for 20 years and it works fine. You know, well, clearly things aren't working fine. So I love this attitude we have here of thinking differently, acting differently, and using technology. And I want to be clear, I think it's more about the people than the technology, but the technology can help. So I personally believe that the environmental crisis we face isn't going to be solved through traditional methods alone. We need you folks thinking outside the box. And just quickly, uh, my group Ocean Alliance, founded in 1971, we're sort of an innovation-based science group. And actually, we're the group that um, discovered that whales sing songs, and our recordings are on the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft, so I think I'm officially a space cadet. Um, because, anyway, and I'm not actually gonna call my wife, but I have a whale recording here, so I'll just try playing you. So this is one animal just recirculating the air in its lungs. Anyway, that's for the one hour talk. I'll just move on. Um, so, um, so at my end type of thing, I don't want to live in a world without whales, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't really care if you don't care about whales, but the reality is it's very simple mathematics. Healthy whales, healthy oceans, healthy humans. And I was talking to a friend of mine a couple of days ago and she said, Ian, you should probably put in a slide about whale poo. So why not? But actually being quite serious here, the International Monetary Fund article in 2019 said, it's behind the plant, that whales were nature's solution to climate change. And again, this is another one hour talk and I'm not gonna read everything up there, but in its simplest manner, all of the energy that comes on this planet comes from the sun. The planet is covered 71% by water and phytoplankton are the most prolific plant on the planet, okay? Two out of three of every breath you take come from our ocean. And phytoplankton needs fertilization. And guess what? These conveyor belts and, you know, et cetera, whales are the earthworms of the sea. And I really believe, I know we've done overfishing, but I really believe a lot of ecological issues we're currently facing have really been caused because we killed millions of whales. And I, I tell people, you know, you've got a boat, you've got an anchor chain. If you take a link out of an anchor chain, it doesn't work anymore. And by killing millions of whales, we took away the fertilizers, the primary fertilizers of our ocean. But that's another one hour talk. So what Ocean Alliance does is what we call conservation biology. They're people that collect data for the sake of collecting data, but we want to understand the problem and then try to solve it. And generally the problem tend to be man-made. So I spent a lot of my life doing health assessments of whales. Are the whales healthy? Well, you can't sort of go up to a whale and ask a whale. So here I am on the boat and I would shoot this little biopsy into a whale and I get a little tissue sample that I could do a sort of analysis from, from our boat. And in many ways, I felt like I, felt like I was playing the world's most expensive version of a game in North America called Whack-A-Mole. I'd race over here, and well, I guess it was Whack-A-Whale, and the a whale would dive. There'd be one over there, I'd race over there, and the whale would dive. And on a boat, so it was costing me like $3,000 a day, so I'm sort of on the front of the boat, ripping up $100 bills, not getting the data I need. And there's a problem there, because I think the other problem with oceanography is, is sort of a prerogative of the privilege. It's an expensive business to study whales. Anyway, one of these days, at the end of the day, I really need the sample. I needed the number. I didn't get the sample, okay? The whale dove, and I sat there in absolute frustration, and to add insult to injury, I got covered in a cloud of whale exhalation. And trust me, it's smelly, it's sticky, and you're hot, and you're bothered. I should have, I should have studied bees. Anyway, 
So there's another problem with reference to um, studying endangered species, which is what we call the endangered species paradox, okay? Because the problem is, is that, well, okay, for you, I, think we, I think somehow the framing of the slide is out, but not to worry. Um, um, on one side, you've got, you know, study, learn, but interfere. And then on the other side, which is somehow missing, you've got leave alone in ignorance, okay? And this is particularly crucial when it gets to critically endangered species, okay? Because these are the animals we really want to get the information from, but we can't because we're terrified we could become part of the problem, all right? Well, let's just go back to that smelly, sticky day. And I was sitting there and I thought, wait a minute. You know, whales are blowing out at like 150 miles an hour. I wonder if there's any data in this exhalation. And I did a little bit of experimentation, and I found out that this whale exhalation is, is full of sort of biological information. You know, DNA and hormones. And I'm like, okay. So I thought we would develop a new tool to collect a whale's exhalation. And you need to understand science, you know. It's sort of prestigious and we, we have to be sort of, you can tell how formal I, are, I am. So I thought I needed to name this tool something that really represented the significance and importance of this new tool. So I called it Snotbot. And to be clear, just so you see, we have these Petri dishes on here and on the top. And when a whale blows, actually the whale's swimming, so the blow is sort of like at an arc. So we could just fly the drone through the whale's exhalation and collect all this biological information. And the animal has literally been to the doctor and it doesn't even know. So this works really well for critically endangered species. And hopefully this video is gonna work. Oh, here we go. So here's Snotbot in action. Isn't that cool? And the whale has, <laughs> there, thank you, there you go. The, the whale has no idea it, it's being sampled. And here's another one. I was using a 360 camera. You see the Petri dishes here. And I will be clear with you, to try it out, of course I chose the largest animal on the planet with lungs the size of a VW. But if you're trying to develop a new tool, you've got to do sort of proof of concept some way. So Snotbot has been great. And what's really been fantastic about it, typically if you get a tool like a hammer, you know what I mean? A hammer will hammer in a nail or it will take out a nail. With Snotbot, as said, DNA, hormones, microbiomes, we can say, is an animal pregnant? Is an animal stressed? Is it lactating? Is it male? Is it female? Is it this animal's brother, cousin, sister, aunt? All of this from the exhalation. And then we can do photogrammetry here where we can work out the size of the animal. Is it fat? Is it skinny? Is it healthy? And then on and on, tracking behavior, photo ID. I mean, it's great. All from a drone. And these drones, one to two thousand dollars. So we didn't build our own drone, we just got an off-the-shelf drone so anyone could do it. And about 40 groups worldwide are currently using our protocols with drones. Now, whales are still very difficult to study. And I've had it at this conference, and I'll take the compliment at any time, but people like Ian, you have the best job in the world. Well, you want to know what I spend most of my time looking at? Where's the whale? So, I mean, whales live under the water. You know, they visit the surface, they live under the water. So what's really exciting, a few years ago, these folks developed these data tags, okay? And these data tags, the top one's got a camera on it, and the bottom one doesn't, but they're basically depth, speed, orientation. It's almost like a Fitbit. We can go into the abyss and see how that whale is living its daily life. And here on the foraging, the animal was diving down, it was sort of coming up, and it was looking up using a silhouette effect to see the prey, scooping the prey, rolling down, and actually the whale was rolling over backwards to scoop the prey, that's another longer story. But, so it's really exciting that we've got these tags. We put them on a whale. They stay on for about 72 hours. There are also tracking tags. But I want to know, how is that animal living its life? Because then I know how human behavior is affecting it. But there was a problem. There was a problem. Can you imagine like if Arnold Schwarzenegger came rolling through here now on a motorcycle saying, like, where's the enemy? You'd be like, what? What's going on? 
The poor whales were chasing them down in this little boat with like a 20-foot pole and trying to whack this tag on the back of a whale. And I thought, you know what? There's got to be a better way. But I want to tell all of you this because I think it will likely happen to you. Everybody was sort of against me in the beginning or against us. You can't do that. Oh, it'll cost $100,000 to have a sort of development. And, and actually, I applied for a grant, an innovation grant, and they said it was too innovative. And they would give me like $10,000 to write up a feasibility study. And I'm like, yeah, forget about it. So what we did is we got some tags. And then one of my staff loves 3D printing. And I'm like, can we do this? Can we do that? So we literally printed out hundreds of things that we stuck tags on you know, to try them out. And then I say, use the tools you have. Now, in, in, in North America, there's a show called The Mythbusters. And they use this stuff called ballistic gel. So we bought this ballistic gel, and we just dropped a tag onto the gel, and then we dropped it, then we put ballistic gel on my Prius, and we drove it down the road, and then we put it on a surfboard. And you know what? The tags were sticking. So I'm like, hey, let, let's see if that works. We also developed Walter, the wannabe whale, okay? And there's Walter with the wheels, and we would fly the drone, because it was winter time in New England, and we'd just fly the drone along, with my iPhone just recording it, and we just drop the tags onto the ballistic gel. I'm like, okay, let's give it a... But it's this idea of like, just throw stuff at the wall. You know what I mean? If you've got an idea, play with it. Don't be sort of, don't be, you know, don't let people beat you down. So anyway, last year we had three different drones, two different tags, three different tag holder designs, and we took them down to Baja, again, with blue whales, the biggest whale on the planet. And there were two designs. One has got this little dart on it, and basically the idea was we drop it from quite high, and then it would sort of fly down and stick on the whale, and the little dart bit falls off. With the camera tags, we just got very low because they were a little heavier, heavier and dropped them. And how did it go? Oh my God, it was amazing. So, I mean, that simple. Isn't that crazy? How am I doing on time? Wait a minute. Okay, thank you. No, no, no. So this is with the camera tag. We put a camera tag on the whale, okay? And this is just using a 360 degree camera. Bam. And so actually, so that's a 360 camera there. There's the camera I'm flying from. And this is actually the view from the camera. I love this sound. Wait a minute. Anyway. So now we are literally going into the abyss with the whale. We've got acoustics, so like if a boat comes up and it stops feeding, we know energetics, how these animals are living their lives. And it was a real game changer because I went out with some folks from sort of NOAA to tag some whales, and I said, okay, which whale do you want the tag on? Well, like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, do you want it on the mother calf? Do you want it on this one? Do you want it on that one? They're like, we'll take any freaking whale you can tag. You know what I mean? So the, the whole concept of we could choose what animal. And there was a little bit of a concern because one of my friends said, maybe the animals they'd been tagging were animals they could catch. And maybe the animals they could catch were sick or unwell. So you're making population assessments based on studying animals that are not well. So I said to them, OK, you know, where do you want the tag? Well, they couldn't believe it. Okay, so we talked about that. Then I said, has anybody ever actually monitored the effect of putting a tag on? And they said to me, well, how would you do that? And I said, well, you'll put a camera tag on, and then we'll drop another tag in front of the camera tag. They're like, hey, what? Drop another? So here we go. So the camera tag is on the, on the whale, OK? Actually, you can see the drone like reflected up there. So we drop the data tag there in front of the camera tag, and we can now go underwater. So, you know, literally when I started with this, people like, you know, you can't do this. And we have absolutely revolutionized the way that we do whale research. And I've been lucky, I've worked in 20 countries in my career, and the one thing I feel is, is talent is global, but opportunity isn't. 
And now, you know, you don't have to rent a research vessel. You can use a drone and, and all this type of stuff. It's exciting. I have to say one other thing I thought was fun, a new idea. I'm like, you know what? We don't really want to film whales. How about we have the whales film the whales? And this is just a very short clip. The, this is on the back of a mother humpback whale, and she's asleep. And this baby's going, I've got a mouth. I've got a mouth. What is this? You can actually hear whale songs in the background. But you know, it, it really has been revolutionary. And again, it was just going back because I believed in the other idea and I, and I sort of got people to support me. Now this is an interesting one. I'm just going to explain. It, actually, this particular species called say whale, only two have ever been tagged ever in the whole world, okay? And that was because they swam by the boat and they put the tag on. But this particular animal, well, I'll play, I'll play it and then we'll play it again just quickly. So the tag goes on, and let's say we count. We say one, two, three, four, five. The animal's feeding. Now again, I still feel if Arnold Schwarzenegger or someone similar came through here, you would stop what you're doing. You'd be like, what the hell? The fact that that animal literally was feeding five seconds after we put a tag on it meant it really didn't care. You know, it didn't care that we had this tag on it. And you know what? Let's just try playing that one more time. Just... Oh, so we just see it here. Because the observer effect, you don't want the act of collecting the data to change the data, particularly um, in the case of, of endangered species. Okay, so I'm, not, I'm running out of time here, so I'll just quickly, but in short, when you look at this top line, the average distance we were from the, male, from the whale was 490 meters away. So we didn't with the boat. So we didn't even have to get close. And actually, the average time it took us to get a tag on the whale was two minutes and 45 seconds. And there's lots of stories, and we've got the 3D dive and, and whatever, but you can see the foraging, but that's another one hour talk. Um, so when you look at good businesses, you know, businesses that do well, they, they take an advantage of an opportunity. We need this, we need that. I personally think um, the saving the wild world, sorry, excuse me a minute, I get, ah, this is a bit embarrassing. Anyway, I think saving the wild world is the single greatest opportunity that um, humanity's ever had. Sorry.